Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Helen Carasso, and I'm speaking to you from a slightly overcast Oxford while we're doing our weather check-ins. Um, I'm, um, I've been asked by EDGE to chair this seminar on the future role of universities. So our exam question for today is, what is the future role of universities? Um, we've got an hour and a half, and I think one of my most important missions is to try to keep everybody to time so that we cover as much as we can in that time and still get a chance for lots of different people to express their opinions and share their experiences with us. So the aim of the webinar is to investigate how the role of universities is changing, particularly in the time when we hear a lot of talk about tertiary education, but when it really comes to it, many people really perhaps don't understand the wider meanings of tertiary education, instead focusing still on the traditional university model. So we want to know how different institutions that at the grassroots level are actually thinking more creatively, are responding and adapting their offer to meet the needs of learners and the needs of industry and society more generally. We're particularly interested in hearing about new challenges that universities are facing, how learner requirements are changing and the approach universities are taking towards vocational and real world learning. Um, we, of course, unfortunately don't have any students on our panel. However, what we do have is some students talking to us through videos, sharing their experiences and their hopes and aspirations for higher education. I should explain that my own background is most recently um, teaching and researching higher education with a particular interest in fees, funding and um, access and widening participation questions. I see some people on the call who I've worked with on um, various aspects of that over time. I'm now an honorary fellow attached to the education department in the University of Oxford, but I actually first entered universities as a communications and marketing professional, having worked in the government information service for a number of years. So I've worked at the University of Brighton before I came to work at the University of Oxford where I was Director of Public Relations and then Director of Undergraduate Admissions. I'm now what you might call semi-retired and I combine the academic and professional experience I have in accreditation um, inspections for the British Accreditation Council where we often visit smaller institutions who are starting on the journey of delivering higher education or other models of tertiary education and I also work as a consultant for SUMS who some of you will know as a specialist not-for-profit higher education consultancy. So those both give me the opportunity, which is really quite a privileged one, to go into and understand quite a bit about the workings of different institutions right across the spectrum of UK higher education. So just um, a little bit of quick housekeeping. So we will hear from our three speakers on the panel today who represent three quite different sorts of institutions and also bring with them significant experience from different parts of the sector. We'll hear the videos I was telling you about of student perspectives and uh, then also hear from EDGE Foundation's project, which it's working on with the EDGE Hotel School at the University of Essex, which is a programme on which students undertake a degree course in events and hospitality management while gaining practical experience in a four star country house hotel. Um, after each speaker, we'll have just five minutes for questions that are specifically related to what they have said. Um, then we should, at the end of it all, have about half an hour for more open and general discussion. And if you could put questions in Q&A rather than chat, we're much more likely to see them. But please do use the chat as well, as you see appropriate to add links. And I think that where necessary and helpful, EDGE will be adding links to policy documents and other papers that we hear about. You have seen that the um, session is being recorded throughout and will be available on the EDGE website after completion. So, with not much further ado, let's move on now to our first panellist, who is Professor Sir David Bell. Now, he's speaking to us from Sunderland, where he is Vice-Chancellor and Chief Executive of the University. 
He, before that, was vice chancellor of Reading for a number of years. Um, he actually began his career, I believe, as a primary school teacher and has had a number of other policy roles in higher education. At one point, as Her Majesty's Chief Inspector of Schools and also as permanent secretary of the Department of, of Education. So he brings with him a very wide range of uh, experience and can look at initiatives that have come and gone and succeeded and failed. And I look forward to hearing very much of what you have to say. Over to you, Sir David. Thanks very much, Helen. Good afternoon, everyone, from sunny Sunderland. In a world where there is significant competition between universities, and quite a lot of money is spent on marketing. Everyone wants to be unique. But in our quieter moments, most of us would accept that most universities do what most other universities do. They teach and students learn. They conduct research and they seek to apply their knowledge to the wider world. Of course, they do these things to a greater or lesser degree. And the mix is different from institution to institution. But except in the most trivial sense, it is hard to make the case that every university is unique and completely different to every other university. So maybe our attention should be better focused on the distinctiveness of different institu institutions and what it is that enables them to tell their story about the work they do. And that leads me nicely to the University of Sunderland, the institution which I am honoured and proud to lead. As a former polytechnic, we acquired university status 30 years ago. But that very best spirit of the polytechnics infuses us even today with our continuing focus on practical, vocational and applied subject. The significant impact that we have on the local and regional economy and the way in which we are able to combine an academically rigorous education with a profound commitment to raising access to higher education. But as well as being deeply rooted locally and perhaps befitting a city by the sea, we are now a national and internationally facing university with 27,500 students worldwide. Around 4,500 students work at our University of Sunderland in London campus, and around 700 students at the University of Sunderland in Hong Kong, where we are the only British university now to hold a fully owned campus there. Transnational education, where students in study for University of Sunderland qualifications overseas is growing substantially. And we now have around 7,000 students in 14 countries following that route. And such diversity of provision is seen even here in Sunderland, where we have our over 1,000 apprentices studying with us alongside the 11,500 students in the campuses here, with over a third of them being on courses in our Faculty of Health Sciences and Wellbeing. And that last point about that faculty speaks to our role now and in the future of creating a career focused and professions facing curriculum where students studying medicine, we were one of the new publicly funded medical schools in 2019, nursing, paramedic science, physiotherapy, occupational therapy, and the like are taught by industry experienced and expert academics. They also benefit from facilities that are as close to what you would find in the best of the NHS to be almost indistinguishable. And that applies to our other professions facing courses, such as engineering, computer science, law, business, tourism, teaching, social work, and the creative arts, whether that's in the teaching and learning or the research and knowledge exchange activities we pursue. But we haven't just drifted into who we are and what we aspire for our future as an institution. We have, over the years, due to the vision and ambition of those who have gone before, made conscious choices as to which areas to be in and which to exit. 
We did something that most universities find unbelievably difficult. Instead of starting things, we stopped doing some things. Controversially for some, perhaps we exited courses in history, politics, and modern languages in January 2020, as they had low student take up, and we decided that they weren't quite consistent with our institutional focus. Alongside that, all of our capital expenditure and staffing decisions have been relentlessly targeted on those areas that support the professions facing curriculum and our desire to focus in our research related activities in areas where we have both something distinctive to say and the critical mass to have impact. I emphasize that point because the questions of what universities are for also, in my view, requires each institution determine, to determine what they are not. For me, educational sustainability and financial sustainability must go together. There's no point in having the best educational ideas if they are financially ruinous. But equally, a university is first and foremost an educational institution, and that must drive its mission, but in a business-like manner. So as well as becoming educationally more distinctive and stronger in recent years, we have also managed our finances very carefully and prudently with sustainable underlying surpluses and substantial cash now to support our investment ambitions. Much of the thinking that we have done has been influenced by the continuing regeneration and reimagination of the city of Sunderland, which is led by an outstanding leader of the council and chief executive, both of whom have demonstrated an extraordinary capacity to get things done. My mantra has always been that a strong university needs a strong city and a strong city needs a strong university. On that, we are one with Sunderland City Council, as we both believe that there has been too narrow a conception of social mobility, which has meant that students from less advantaged backgrounds leave cities like ours to attend so-called prestigious universities, never to return. Now that's fine for some, but our ambition is to enable a student to have choice, the choice to stay in our great city, study for a degree or other qualification, get a socially purposeful job and improve their own family's life chances immeasurably. At the same time, they can stay rooted in the city and region that they are from and that they continue to love. After all, allegiance to home, family, community and place can be more powerful motives than what can sometimes appear to be a ruthless pursuit of opportunities and salary hikes. Something which occasionally educated and highly mobile people, and I put myself in that category, have ignored for too long. Finally, our underpinning purpose is to be a life-changing institution, and one that offers transformative experiences to all those who come through our doors. That's inevitably work in progress. But as long as we stay focused on such a mission, then we are entirely comfortable with that as a future role for our university. Thank you, Helen. Thank you so much. That was a really brilliant start. And thank you so much for not um, forcing me to try and work out how to um, flag you down from halfway up across the country. Um, well, um, we've now got about five minutes for any questions that people would like to ask about from David about Sunderland or other, other parts of his experience. Um, I'll take Chair's prerogative, though, while we're waiting for questions to come in, if I may. Um, you talk very much and quite inspiringly about the relationship with the local community and the importance of being grounded in that community and being 
focusing on, on what you do in that base. Um, but also you have other campuses and other methods of delivery. Um, to what extent do you aim to give students through the very different ways that you deliver your courses, the same Sunderland experience? You talked about the distinctiveness of Sunderland, but are there distinctivenesses for each different mode of delivery or do you believe there are core things underpinning it even if people are studying in Hong Kong? Helen, you must have been listening to some of the conversations we've been having just this week at the university. Um, on the first point about civil connectedness, we're not complacent about that. And indeed, uh, on this very day, yesterday and tomorrow, we have colleagues from an organisation called Public First, who are doing work in the communities to find out what people really think about the university. And I just make the general point here that there's often a complacent assumption that everyone knows us and everyone loves us. I think that is a complacent assumption. I suspect most people, if they know us, will be neutral. And I think part of our role as a university and all universities is to understand more about those that are not connected to us, what they think and how we might engage further. On your second point about distinctiveness, I think it's quite difficult, frankly, because there's a tension here between the autonomy that you want to provide to your uh, campuses elsewhere, particularly London and Hong Kong, while set against the institutional mission. And interestingly, Helen, I think we're going perhaps even more towards the autonomy route than we are to the uniformity route. Now, there'll be some overarching values that actually apply everywhere and certain formal requirements that apply everywhere. But I think we have to be humble enough in Sunderland to recognise that our colleagues in London and our colleagues in Hong Kong and indeed our colleagues in the transnational partners have got a better understanding of their context than we might have. One last point in this one, Helen. Different modes of delivery are complicated. And I suspect if there are other colleagues from universities that are offering the range of things that we are offering, they'll know that there's both an overhead cost in doing that and actually bluntly some disincentives to do it, as well as just the complexity of enabling academic staff and professional services staff to shift from different modes as different kinds of qualifications mm -hmm. are in place. Thank you. That's very, that, uh, uh, recognising the problems is often the first step which is trying to solve them and it sounds as if you're having good and open discussions we've got a question come in from um one of um the participants gaia and she's saying she says fascinating introduction thank you um you emphasize the importance of giving students choice and helping them to get purposeful jobs um, and to judge what is required to support each student with bespoke career guidance so they, that they can find and succeed in resilient careers. Um, what, what do you do or and where do you think that you and or other universities could improve in that area? Well, I think it's a really excellent uh, question. I mean, the university, uh, without drawing too hard a distinction, is probably um, divides into two. There are those courses which are very obviously on a vocational route, <clears throat> excuse me, one might include in that medicine or nursing or pharmacy, where it's very clear that most of those students will be straight into the uh, program, uh, uh, into the career they've chosen through the program. There are other courses like career science, engineering, tourism, so on, where there's a very distinctive vocational bias to the qualification, but there's not necessarily the same route into the graduate level job. And I think it's the latter that we are more concerned about than the former, although I wouldn't say we're unconcerned about the former. And therefore, we have set up something recently called the Centre for Graduate Prospects, because I think, like, perhaps, again, thinking of others, many other institutions, we were beginning to feel that a lot of our work to support our students to become employable graduates was a bit spread out across the university, it was a bit disjointed. It wasn't always connecting with the academic activity back to the professional services activity. So what we're trying to do is to bring all of that under one umbrella. Now, we're in very, very early days. I mean, literally months of doing that. But I think it does um, represent for us 
an opportunity, but I think it's also an opportunity that has reflected a risk where we need to do better, in, <clears throat> certainly in some programs, in ensuring that our students get the right kind of graduate level opportunities. But I think bringing all together what we're doing as a university is a good first step. Thank you. We've got questions coming in thick and fast now. A number of them, I think we can hold back for the general discussion and the group discussion. Um, if you look in the, in the Q&A, there's one you might want to type an answer to, the second one, which is particularly about Sunderland and your regional work. But I think what we'll do now is we'll hand over to Ollie and we can then see what some of your students think and other students at, at institutions we're going to be hearing about and be back with everybody in about five minutes. Thank you for now, David. A very helpful start. Thank you. Universities helping me to understand working environments through group projects. Conducting live briefs helps me to understand how workers in the field that I wish to pursue think when they are working for clients. I am a nursing student and the clinical skills area is set out the same as a modern NHS ward. The mannequins used are state of the art and react to our interventions. The communication skills I am achieving face to face and online is preparation to the new ways nursing is now delivered. Nursing is no longer just in person, but also can be delivered in a virtual ward environment or over the telephone. The university is helping us prepare for future work and future and careers by giving us the experience to develop our skills, particularly in the field that me and Lucy are in. Um, we get the experience to communicate effectively with patients and good teamwork and with our colleagues. We also find that it's given us the skills to practice um, tasks that we do usually do on the wards, so examining patients um, and doing practical procedures. And I've also found that the university has been really helpful in preparing us for potential research projects. I would expect live briefs to be a part of all universities in the future, as they allow students to understand what it is like to be in a working environment and what their expectations are. I would also expect career fairs to be a part of universities as they allow students to receive the support that they need when searching for a career that they want to pursue in the future. Finally, I think that all universities should have lecturers who are truly passionate about the subjects that they teach so that they can inspire others to have that same eagerness for the subject that they have. I would like to see universities offer equal standards to access current and up-to-date technologies. Students' health and well-being is important and ARU advocate this well across all of their campuses. Other universities should follow the model that ARU have set out and offer the same standards. All universities should offer students the chance to be the best they can be by offering access to up-to-date research and good support in how to prepare for assignments. I think it's really important that universities have good services for students so in particular mental health and support services. I find that university is really stressful because of exams and dissertations and general essays that you have to do. Um, you're always pushing towards a deadline and I think that can stress a lot of students out. So I think it's really important to have these mental health services available that students can like reach to if they need additional support. I also think that they should have a lot of library uh, services and spaces to do revision and work because um, I think it's really important to have a good learning environment and finally I think that they should have uh, university should give you an opportunity to volunteer as maybe a student rep and um, to help other students out and push your ideas on how the universities can improve in the future. I see the role of universities to enable students to transition into a working environment by gaining new skills and knowledge whilst learning how to work in a workplace effectively. I see universities in the future integrating further with the local community. Students studying for their course and learning and developing skills through working and volunteering locally, offering a wide range of courses that integrates with a changing workplace due to digital technologies. I think um, university degrees are a good transition from being in school to a work life and a career and things like that. 
Um, not everyone gets the opportunity to go to university. However, I think it's a perfect opportunity to experience what you enjoy and what you maybe dislike um, and what a role might be suited to you. Um, and I think it's a, it's a really positive way to meet people um, and develop skills that you maybe didn't know you had previously. So um, um, sort of role modeling or presentations and things like that. So I think universities are a perfect way um, to develop your skills push your ideas into sort of society and integrate well into the work life um, in the future. Well, thank you to those students who I think of them. Um, well, set us challenges, which I hope we might have had already, but it's really interesting to hear what people on the receiving end of, our, of the education that we deliver are hoping for and I'm pleased to see that much of it I think is what we would agree we are aiming to deliver as well. So um, no no pressure then on the um, on our, our speakers to make sure that they meet up those expectations and indeed our next speaker is Professor Ross Renton. Now he's principal of ARU Peterborough which is a new university for Peter for Peterborough, for Peter, for Peterborough, sorry. Um, he was um, senior, previously senior pro vice chancellor at the University of Worcester um, and has also been held senior role at the University of Hertfordshire. His own background, he has particular interests in winding participation access issues, and he has been involved very heavily in the TEF in the early stages. So um, he brings with him a very good understanding of um, different types of students and the different types of learning experiences that they have in our universities and what it is like to set up a whole new institution. So I look forward to hearing about that and I'll keep an eye on the time, but about 10 minutes if you would. Thank you, Ross. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Helen. And thank you to Edge for inviting me to come in and share what we're doing uh, here in Peterborough. And I have to say, I'm immensely proud of the students uh, and what they had to say. Uh, it's the first time I've watched those uh, videos and having the advocates already for us only seven months in to our uh, journey in the sense of we only opened in September, uh, hearing from their experiences and the impact they're having. Um, in this short session, I'd want to share just a, a few bits about what we're doing. I genuinely believe this is one of the most exciting developments in higher education at the moment. Um, and I hopefully I'll give you a sense of that over the next uh, 10 minutes. And in doing that, I'll talk a little bit about our strategic rationale for a new university uh, here in Peterborough really want to pinpoint on our mission and we've got a really clear mission, a distinctive mission and what we're trying to achieve. And that really will set us forward for the future. Uh, I also uh, look to touch on some of the milestones we've had already and the impact we've had. And in fact, we won our first award only two weeks ago uh, for the impact we're having on the region and in the communities we're a part of, as I say, only opened their set doors seven uh, months ago. And in a little bit of our future, what's our ambition uh, for uh, the institution? So first of all, a little bit about Peterborough. Peterborough, for me, is a, a fantastic city. It's got a, a long history of being a welcoming city, uh, a city of immigration. Um, but also it goes back to Norman times and Norman Cathedral. We have got uh, Catherine of Aragon buried here. We've had for a while Mary Queen of Scots as well. Uh, but the city is also has a range of challenges. And some of which are around social mobility. So when you look at things like NVQ level four, so that first rung into higher education, it's got uh, around about 32% uh, participation compared to uh, nationally, where we're about 25% less uh, than the rest of, of the country. But also when you look at the social and health deprivation in Peterborough, there are some wards we have where female life expectation, uh, uh, expectancy is below uh, the age of retirement. And we also, when we look at our measures around child poverty and also uh, the social mobility index, Peterborough and also the Fenlands perform particularly poorly. So, for example, in that social mobility index, Peterborough is at the, uh, sorry, Fenlands at the bottom 1.5% and Peterborough is at the bottom 40%. So uh, a real social issues to, um, uh, to try and address. Uh, some of the good news is this high level of demand for higher education 
from employers uh, in the region. They're really desperate for those to come in. If uh, I were doing slides, I'd show you a lovely graph and a big line going up, and that big line would show you uh, that demand level for those uh, students coming out with higher education level qualifications. And every single employer we engage with, we get the same uh, the same response. They're looking for those with higher skills. Uh, high levels of employment in the region, but not necessarily those with the higher skills. So a real distinctive, uh, clear mission for us uh, to do. Um, and when you look at the destinations at the moment of 18 year olds in particular, uh, we're lagging behind national figures, but also we're lagging behind um, uh, the East of England. And when you talk about things like levelling up, there's a real distinctive difference between the north and the south of the county. So if you look at Cambridgeshire, uh, towards the south, as you can imagine, progression there is particularly high, high-skilled economy. You go to the north of the county, that's a distinct difference there. So what's being done about it? Well, Peterborough itself has had an ambition for 40 years to have a university. It's one of the kind of largest uh, urban corporations without um, uh, a university. And what came together was a local authority who saw it as being a, a priority for them, working with the combined authorities, that devolution deal, then they went out for an academic partner to set up a brand new institution. That only happened three years ago. Um, and uh, hopefully you'll again get a sense of the amount of uh, distance we've traveled uh, in those uh, short few years. The academic partner that was successful was Anglo Ruskin University, ARU. And they've got a, a really fantastic heritage of working on a regional basis of sites uh, in Cambridge and also in Chelmsford and in London. But also, I've got a really clear understanding of their mission, and that fits really well with what's happening uh, here in Peterborough. So that partnership came together uh, with an agreement about a pathway to create a new institution, including registration with the Office for Students, degree awarding powers, research degree awarding powers. All of those things are within a route map with those partners. And I have to say the partnership that's there, a determined local authority, a determined uh, combined authority and a university partner working together to create something uh, which uh, could have easily not got off the ground during uh, a pandemic and during a really tough period for higher education uh, and for local authorities actually became a strength. People working through ways to make this happen, whether it be down to things like procurement, or looking at how you can have innovation within uh, the curriculum. Uh, with the development, we've been able to open, and we opened just in September uh, there, our first building, um, uh, you can see some of it behind me here, it is a fantastic example of really learning from what works well in the sector, but also learning about where we want to go uh, into the future. Uh, so our architects, MCW, uh, have been phenomenal at working really closely with us at all the phases we've been uh, looking at and ensuring that our learning spaces really reflect our curriculum. Uh, and our curriculum is designed for when students are on campus, they're collaborating, they're using special space, they're working in small groups. And that's designed all the way through our expansion as an institution. And in fact, uh, one of the first things we looked at with the building is about removing any large tiered lecture theatres, uh, but also looking about how we ensure that collaboration happens within our spaces. Uh, so a really nice example is our staff um, uh, all sit together. They don't uh, split out into professional and academic, but also they don't sit separately into their subject areas. So it is a collaborative environment, including the senior team. With that, we're already seeing sparks of inspiration coming. So we've got, for example, our mechatronics uh, engineers working with our midwives around some of the technology that can be applied together. So having that co-location, um, but also working on co-curricular and also innovative research really will be powerful uh, for the future of the institution. Uh, we've had high level support in what we're doing as well. Uh, so from the Secretary of State to the uh, now Prime Minister, I've been really supportive of what we're doing. And we've, we've taken up quite a bit of capital to get us up and running. So at the moment, our investment is touching on about 80 million pounds. Um, so we've got three phases in the goal as we speak uh, and a further uh, seven to eight phases uh, in total for the institution. Uh, and really interestingly, those first three phases already create a really vibrant 
uh, campus environment. So phase one, this really innovative teaching uh, building, phase two, a bottom-up research facility, and phase three, another teaching building with a living lab and some additional specialist spaces. For us, means that we're really meeting the needs of the region. And I'll talk a moment about our curriculum and how we designed that. Uh, some of our key milestones is uh, we have been able to uh, get that curriculum up and running. We've set up a student union, um, understanding our students come from very diverse backgrounds uh, in what we're doing. We have our own board of governors, uh, and that reflects our community, it reflects industries that we have, uh, but also has national input. So, for example, our chair of board is uh, Rob Behrens, um, who was the independent adjudicator for higher education and now the ombudsman for the NHS and parliament. And we had uh, our very first event really reflecting our permeability. So we see ourselves as being with the community, not doing to the community. Our very first event was with the community. So 2000 uh, people from across Peterborough coming into the university. We did that above and uh, before we did anything with the dignitaries. We really seen the understanding of the science and engineering that's taking place here, inspiring the young people across the city about what the future uh, could be for them. And that really has put it in good stead. We really uh, are now an anchor in the city. We are a university and cathedral city. Uh, and uh, I think we, when we speak to our communities, are really proud of that. Uh, in terms of the curriculum, I thought it'd be worth just touching a little bit about the uniqueness of that. We've co-created that with industry. So uh, we've built that from ground up with industry. So we haven't just lift and laid um, uh, content from our academic partner, but what we've done is we've co-created that. Uh, and in doing so, uh, we've looked at what is needed now uh, by those industries, but also what is needed in the future uh, as well. Uh, and it's about every step of the uh, education of our learners. So, for example, having employers involved in the assessment, having them involved in where we don't need to build some of the facilities, but they could be using theirs. So a really nice example is Photocentric, uh, company based here, Three Queens Awards for Export. They're a specialist in photosensitive polymers. They've got the most cutting edge uh, 3D printing going on. We don't need to replicate that. Our students can be in there and using those facilities. So at the moment, over 200 uh, companies, uh, multinational to some of the small and specialists have been working with us. And that's allowed us to launch uh, four faculties with over 30 uh, courses from year one. So we've got two points of intake, uh, our September and January intake, and with that, we've got courses ranging from business, uh, entrepreneurship and law, uh, to our health and education and social care faculty, to engineering, agri-tech and the environment. And finally, around our creative uh, and digital uh, arts or computer science in there, for example, all built uh, in conjunction uh, with our industry partners. And this is just the start of it. So for us, our next step is we've got investment already to build extended reality facilities. So making sure that industry both benefit from us, but work with us for our students. We've attracted our first set of research funding and we're looking to further expand that. We've got our KTP capacity already into uh, the community. And also we're looking about how we can bring further industries into the city. So we've got that bottom up research taking all place, but we want the top down. So bringing some of the high tech industries into Peterborough and supporting their growth and their innovation. Uh, and I have to say, we've had fantastic support uh, from a range of those multinational uh, industries. And as I say, as we grow, we grow with uh, the city. So ensuring that we aren't being um, uh, uh, high in the hill or separated from it, this is their university. This is the industry's university uh, across this region. Uh, and we're making sure that every step of our development is that uh, they're part of that along, of course, with our students who have made already uh, an impactful contribution to the development of the institution. Uh, so distinctive and hopefully a model that can be applied elsewhere to build that capacity or where we know that higher education is needed across our communities, but also distinctiveness in meeting the needs of the region and the city in which it sits. So thank you very much. And thank you very much. And again, beautifully timed. Thank you so much. Um, one of the things that's so interesting about what you've been talking about there is the collaboration with the industries and being able to use their facilities and their resources. That obviously has many strengths. Do you see it having weaknesses and risks for the institution too? Yeah, I think it's a good point in the sense of um, 
if we were just going to the industries once we developed our course and saying, can we use your facilities now that we've got this course that we're really interested in doing? I think that would be a real challenge for us. I think taking it where we've flipped it and we've started that co-creation piece with them where they really understand what we're trying to achieve. So a really good example is Caterpillar Perkins. We've got degree apprenticeships uh, with them. Really big industry, the import engineers into here. But they want people to stay they want to contribute to the community to help support schools here is grow our own, grow our own from the city. So opening up their facilities, they benefit from that a greater understanding that actually a, a building engines is not a dirty environment anymore. It's a really exciting, you want diversity, people from different backgrounds, more female engineers coming in. The only way to do that is open your doors and we're part of that solution. Thank you. Um, and there's a question that's come in from Martin Field from the Urban Land Institute. He says, and he says, Ross, you're doing great work, great campus and a great city. How close are you to achieving carbon zero in your new buildings? No pressure there. <laughs> yeah, no. Fantastic question from Martin, who um, I think has been, been up to see the, certainly not the next building, but has been seeing the first building uh, on it. Um, it, it we're, we're following the things you would expect. So uh, for those who know kind of buildings, and I've got to know them really well over the past two years, certainly, um, we're, we're following the Briam um, uh, uh, classification. So for our first building, it's very good. We've upped our ambition for our third building. So we're looking for Briam. Excellent. And even kind of small things. So for example, biodiversity on campus, uh, we really thought that through. So it's a really nice green space in the heart of the city. Uh, we have bees on our roof, which um, uh, contribute to the biodiversity. But when you look at some of the really practical things about the building is self-ventilating uh, on the whole, apart from obviously really specialist areas. And also we've got about 50% recycled concrete being used in our foundations. And it's really interesting, our students hold us to account on this, so it's not just about what we've got to say. Our students are really good at holding our feet to the fire and saying, what are you doing? So our environmental science students in particular, but also our other courses as well, where they're asking the really difficult questions about energy use, but how they can support and contribute to what we're doing, but behaviours, because behaviours are a big part of reducing our carbon footprint. And we've got some really ambitious plans in our, our uh, environmental strategy as well. So there's a staff and student group around that working to ensure that we don't just talk about it, but we're doing it on campus. So really keen, uh, and Martin and anyone else who wants to come and visit and find out a bit more about that, really keen to show. That's, that's very kind, thank you. And just one last question before we move on to the next video. Mike Ratcliffe has asked, says, says your presentation of the excellent progress of, of ARUP to us shows the strength of the model of developing new provision from within a university. And this is much easier than starting from scratch as a provider. Um, and he quotes some other examples of, of similar model to yours and says, we need to find more ways to enable universities to do this what do you, how how do you think this model can be promoted and sold to other regions to other universities to think about working that way maybe yeah absolutely i mean what i'd say first is you do need some risk appetite to do these things um so uh, a, a huge amount of praise actually for the Anglo Ruskin team and particularly the vice chancellor uh, and the, the board of governors there, because in some ways you're building an institution could become a competitor. I mean, the, the reality is you know, if we're really successful, then, then there's that potential. I think the reality is we want to work together uh, all the way through. At the moment we've got a, a shared services model, for example, where we save huge amounts of money, uh, not having to replicate things that could be done uh, that are already established. Now, I think there's a bit about in understanding kind of where that makes a difference. So where is the distinctiveness needed? Where is the regional focus needed? And where can we be sharing things? And I think the whole sector could be looking at that uh, more often. So there's a lot of small and specialist institutions. I've been involved with Guild HE for a long while. I think there's a huge amount of potential for that collaboration and some of those kind of, I don't like the term back office uh, functions, but it kind of is a good shorthand for it. Mm -hmm. But then understanding kind of where that distinctiveness, regional demand, curriculum innovation can take place, uh, I think really sits well. So yeah, there is um, potential for that. I think our model has been able to happen really quickly. I arrived here two years to an empty car park and we've now got funding for three buildings and two buildings up and going. So that's a really quick model to get going. And I'd argue that's what we need to be seeing across the UK. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, now um, the next video, we're going to see about the Edge Hotel School based at the University of Essex, a project with which, which Edge has been following closely. Over to you, Ollie. a unique 
unique dynamic here because our students are studying at the University of Essex on campus, but also because we have a four-star country house hotel on campus with us, the students get this opportunity to develop their communication skills and their confidence. So what we find that the industry is looking for are students that, yes, they do have a qualification, they have a degree, but they've also got the ability to do the job. So they're instantly employable when they graduate from the Edge Hotel School. So I chose to study um, at the Edge Hotel School um, because of it, it being a practical as well as um, a uni degree at the same time. Um, I've always been sort of practically based. Um, so it's something that really appealed to me because you are getting that experience, but you're also coming out with it with a degree. So you've kind of got it on both levels um, and it sets you well for the future. The practical experience that we get um, during the course is really helpful and just from talking to the experts that come to our guest lectures, they are really keen on the experience that we have. So during my course at the University of Essex, I've worked in different aspects of the industry. So we've worked in the hotel industry, gaining the real life experience at Wibner House Hotel. I've worked in the events industry with working events such as the weddings that we work, but also the Brit Awards from the outside. And I've also worked a lot of conferences, so we've done a lot of outside conferences that we've worked in the hotel. During my time at Edge Hotel School, University of Essex, I've managed to obtain work experience opportunities throughout, and I've managed to work with top industry leaders attending conferences and events. And we've also had a careers fair, which we have every single year, and we managed to network with professionals so that we can obtain jobs afterwards and organise work experience opportunities. What we would look for in an employee, um, particularly if they came from the Edge Hotel School, is the fact that they are passionate about what they're doing. Um, we know that somebody at the Edge Hotel School is committed to studies and to work hard because they're doing that at the same time, which we believe makes them industry ready and a suitable fit for our business. I would definitely recommend doing a degree at the Edge Hotel School because if you're someone that is more inclined to do more practical experience but also have the academic side as well, it's a great course to do. You gain a lot of experience through the hotel and the university. Um, there's a lot of resources at the university and for me it was great and it got me to where I am today. The reason why we're unique is that we are the only hotel school within the UK at higher education level. Our courses require students to work within a real work environment but also our students have immense numbers of opportunities to work with industry as part of their study. So at every level, every unit, we tend to involve members of industry to develop the student experience so that they really understand what is going on within the hospitality or events industries. Thank you very much. We seem to be going from wonderful campus to wonderful campus. And I think that we're now going to go to the campus that most of us will envy most of all when we hear from Tom Sperlinger. And, and Tom is joining us from Black Mountain College in Wales. And they have, I believe, a 120 acre site. And it says, I'm reliably informed by The Guardian, who wrote about the college um, a couple of months ago, the lecture theatre was once a cow shed. The study centre is an old farmhouse living room and classrooms are mostly outdoors. Um, so it's a really, it sounds like a really amazing environment in which to work and entirely suitable for um, an institution that is um, trying to um, help its students to address the real problems of sustainability that we know that we are all facing in the climate emergency, um, but also to be accessible to people in many different ways. Um, I believe that there's a new degree which you're starting um, this year in arts, ecology and climate change, working with Cardiff Met, but you also have a whole range of vocational programmes there. Um, Tom is the academic lead at the college and he's going to talk to us now about the work they're doing and the vision for the college and how that fits into the wider model of the um, tertiary education sector. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Helen. Um, thanks, everyone, including the, the previous speakers. Um, yeah, so I, I'm here to talk to you about Black Mountains College, which, as Helen has said, is based in Talgarth. And one of the big contrasts with the speakers we've already heard from 
um, is that this is a college being created in a, in a rural setting rather than an urban one. And I think that plays into a number of the kind of distinctive features um, of the college. Uh, the inspiration for Black Mountains College was the similarly named Black Mountain College, uh, an experimental college founded in the 1930s in North Carolina and known for the kind of artistic community that grew up around it, but also for the way in which it was energized by and gave energy to kind of anti-fascist struggles in the 1930s, including because uh, of the many uh, refugees from Europe who landed there and found their intellectual home there in the 30s. And our Black Mountains College is inspired by the great crisis of our times, the climate and ecological emergency. And at its heart, um, we think that this is, among other things, a crisis of education and imagination about our ability to live within, learn from, and imagine futures alongside the earth that is our home. So as you've heard, our main campus is this um, 120 acre upland hill farm um, uh, in and around Talgarth, which we're renovating and converting. But we're also working with a sort of distributed model um, campus across uh, the Brecon Beacons National Park and including sites, for example, like Hay Castle, which will be one of uh, the principal locations where we'll start delivering our degree uh, from this September. I want to sort of highlight kind of three principles that I, I think kind of underpin all of our work. One, as Helen already mentioned, is accessibility. Um, and that's partly for reasons that kind of link to things the other speakers already talked about, really, about um, the role generally that higher education can play. But I think it's also because we have a sense that the kind of futures that will emerge out of the climate crisis actually really hinge on who has a say and a voice um, in those debates. And we're committed to creating a community that is genuinely diverse. And that's part of the reason for having, as well as an undergraduate program, a set of FE programs and a short course program as well. But it also feeds into our kind of admission and recruitment policies, which I'll touch on in a moment. The second distinctive theme, I think, is place. Um, that specific location and the relationship to the location is really, really important. All of our programs emphasize learning outside as well as indoors and with the whole body and all of the senses. And I'd say too that we're a proudly Welsh institution um, working closely with the principles of the Future Generations Act in Wales, which as some of you uh, may know, requires all public bodies to consider the well-being of future generations in their work, and which has been a really important stimulus for all of our curricula. The third principle, I think, is um, actually something around urgency. We know that the climate crisis, the climate emergency is happening here and now and requires of all of us urgent adaptation and thinking about how we live individually and collectively. And all of our courses are um, practice oriented, whether, whether you sort of formally designate them academic or uh, vocational for that reason. And we recognize too that climate isn't the only complex and urgent crisis facing us. And our degree program in particular is oriented around sustainable futures and systems change, considering the kind of intersection of different challenges that we all face, including the different kinds of future uh, technology is potentially throwing up uh, challenges to the future of democracy in a digital age, mass migration, uh, and, and the kind of pressures that, that all our economic systems are currently facing. So we have a short course program that includes courses open to everyone, courses targeted particularly at young people, including a very popular annual climate careers fair, which looks crucially not just at what you might think of conventionally as a climate career, but the way in which the climate crisis will affect all careers. Um, and then also courses that are aimed at particular interest groups. So we've run a course recently for parish and town councillors uh, wanting to find out how they can help with the work of building sustainable futures. And we're running another one for shareholders uh, looking at how they can uh, use their influence in various ways. Our further education courses are uh, validated by MPTC group of colleges. And we currently offer uh, NVQ level twos in coppicing and greenwood trades and regenerative, regenerative horticulture with a third NVQ in nature recovery starting later this year. And all of these programs have a shared core that reflects some of that distinctive Black Mountains College mission around sustainable future. Um, 
And that core links to our undergraduate program, which Helen mentioned, uh, which is a BA in Sustainable Futures, Arts, Ecology and Systems Change, which was validated by Cardiff Met last year. And we're currently recruiting our first cohort of students to start this September. The programme is designed to be open access, so we don't require prior qualifications and don't assume particular knowledge at the point of admission. And we're looking to recruit a very broad range of students of all ages and backgrounds, some of whom may well be joining us straight from a prior qualification, but others of whom might have been out of education for years or decades. And the programme will be taught primarily over three days per week to improve accessibility and will ultimately have a part time um, option. Each year of the programme is structured around a kind of overarching question. So year one is how can we learn in a changing world? Year two is how can we address some of the world's most urgent challenges? And then crucially, year three is structured for each student around a question that they design themselves and which they pursue through a combination of a research project, which might have an output that looks like a conventional dissertation, but might have a, a, a different kind of output. And they pursue that alongside um, a module called Change in Practice, uh, which might be in the form of a work placement, a civic engagement project, or a new venture creation project. So for example, a student's final year question might be something like, how can we feed the next generation? Looking in their research project at theoretical issues about food sustainability. And then in the Change in Practice module, working with an organization, looking at exactly those issues in Wales, uh, and how food production can be managed in future. It's worth emphasizing that the program takes a, a consciously interdisciplinary approach to systems change, drawing on these kind of key frameworks from the arts, ecology and socio-technical systems, but also casting the net much more widely. And in year two, students choose to specialize in a particular area, uh, which might be agroecology, uh, socio-technical systems or creative practice. And I just want to say a little bit about our approach to some of those areas of specialization. Creative practice is knitted through the whole program, but this isn't a program that's principally aiming to um, educate people who will go on uh, to be artists and practitioners as the main goal of the program. On the contrary, we think the arts are vital as a way of seeing and knowing to help students to learn individually and also to collectively imagine alternative futures. So we're actually sort of figuring creative practice as a really important part of the pedagogy of the programme uh, and how we help students to achieve its other goals. And similarly, I think with the, the theme around socio-technical systems, we're not going to be creating the future engineers, but actually we think there is a really important gap there around people who can go into a wide range of professions, understanding some of the kind of key issues around futures of technology. It's been interesting to watch all of us really in the education sector having a crash course in AI over the last couple of months. And I think that's been a perfect demonstration of how some of that technological change is only going to accelerate. And we need a much broader range of professionals uh, ready to meet the challenges that come with that. Um, and it's worth perhaps just emphasizing um, as I close that for a program that's principally concerned with futures, we start by thinking about the past in a module called How Can We Understand the Past, which allows students an opportunity to think about how the past is narrated and by whom and how we've arrived at this current moment of crisis. And I think crucially also, and, and this came very directly out of our engagement with young people as we were designing the degree, we've tried to think about the role of kind of hope in imagining possible futures around the climate crisis. A lot of young people told us that they had been awakened to the scale of climate crisis through movements like Extinction Rebellion, but they didn't feel as though they were being offered the tools to take practical action in that context. And I think that's a really important part of the Black Mountains College story. Um, but it's also important to say that we're only really at the beginning of, of our story, and we hope that a really wide range of people are gonna come and help us uh, write the next chapter in it. Um, and it's our hope too that the story of the climate emergency, although by no means at its beginning, still has space for our students and wider community to write a new chapter in that as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tom. That's really, really inspirational. And um, 
I think the the the, 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 the the mixture of learning from the past, something which I know is dear to Edge's heart um, as well, and how you lay down down the legacy and and thoughts for the next generation is is going to be incredibly important. Um, one of the things, one of the questions which actually came up a bit early, but I think is probably quite relevant to ask you about. Um, Kelly Smith asked, I'd be interested to hear how the, pan the panelists' thoughts on changes to cu curriculums at 16 and 18 and their impact on university admissions. And she highlights the fact that we still tend to stick to a very narrow specialism um, rather than a more bacal baccalaureate school leaving qualification. But of course, you're taking people who don't even, what well, even, who don't necessarily enter with those particular formal qualifications. So how do you decide who who are the who are the people who will thrive on your courses and contribute to it? How how do you do your admissions process? And and do you wish there were some sort of test, maybe qualifications, wrong words you could use? I, I think what I'd say about the approach we've taken is that it, it you could argue it's more rigorous in some ways than just doing admissions on the basis of prior qualification. It mm -hmm. it, it it is also more labor intensive to some extent. It requires us to look at each application in um, a bit more detail. And we're quite often um, going to be interviewing and also asking people to complete a sort of creative task as part of the admissions process. So that is more labor intensive potentially from our end, but it does allow us to have more dialogue and more sustained dialogue with applicants in the process of them applying, which we think is really important for them as, as well as for us. No, that's that that's very helpful. We may come back to this in the general discussion. There's one question that's come in that's um specifically um for you from Michael Cross. And he says, Thank you very much, Tom. How does your membership of an international group of universities help to drive and inform the curriculum? Um, yeah, so this refers partly to the Open Societies U Universities Network, I think, which we're um a member of and which um, I think is is really helpful for us for thinking about the work that we're doing, because we're working in a very particular um, location, but actually the issues that are the kind of headlines governing our whole project obviously affect a whole wide range of communities and universities around the world. Mm -hmm. So being part of that network has already allowed us to think about how the issues that our students are grappling with are being dealt with in very different university contexts in the Middle East, um, in the United States, in North America, in South America. And I think that that um, is going to lead, um, as, as, um, as we imagine it at the moment, to um, being able to offer some of our modules within the Open Societies University Network, our students being able to take modules in that, but also some reciprocal um, exchange opportunities but also potentially to curriculum development on a kind of bigger scale in the long term. So what kind of co-development might we have, for example, of degree programmes in, in the long run with other partners? Mm -hmm. And and, um, and obviously through the pandemic, we've learned that you don't actually always need to study locally, but for some of the quite applied work you're doing, presumably you're still going to, going to have to deal with the, with the practical um, climate implications of you know sustain, sustainability implications of travel and the accessibility implications of all that. A absolutely, yeah, and I think that potentially we see the network as providing a really helpful link there. That actually our students are predominantly going to be very place based in terms of their studies, but giving them that kind of online and potentially occasionally in person access to that kind of wider network um, allows them to pose those questions in a much wider range of contexts, mm -hmm. which I think is really important given the nature of the questions they're asking. That's lovely. Well, thank you very much. Now, if our other panelists would like to join us, then um, then we can now open up to a, a, a more a, a wider discussion. And so please, um, everybody, put your questions in the Q&A. Um, now, um, and I think if um, uh, Ross and David would like to pick up on the question that that I picked up from Kelly and asked Tom Tom about about the changes in um, qualifications at sixteen and eighteen, um, particularly in England, and the focus we've had in the past on a very narrow specialism at level three, um, and you know what what do you think about the that sort of model of qualification as as a good model for entry into university should we be moving to a more baccalaureate style or do you favor other approaches such as the more personalized and um 
broadly more broadly skills based and creative thinking based approach that Tom's talked about. Um, yeah, no, I, I like the qualification for the sixteen to eighteen year olds has been a minefield, and it has been now for um, uh, far too long. For uh, I was involved in the original engineering diplomas, so people might remember this. I spent huge amounts of energy and time uh, supporting the department that was working on it, and uh, and also working with UCAS around how we make sure students are able to. And it was a good qualification, but it died. Um, it died a death. Uh, and some of it is about how you get the ingredients working well together. So how do we make sure that employers understand what a qualification is and how that works for the young person that's taking it, or actually the adult learner, but also about how institutions and a diverse sector understanding it. So it's all very well if one or two of us do it, but what about the rest of the sector is understanding what that means for it? Because we undersell to the young people. We undersell to those who are having to decide in the qualifications early on. I've always found the English system far too narrow, I would say, and you can tell from my accent, um, I didn't have that narrow education uh, per se. Um, but also, I think it lacks that element of the diversity of skills that are bringing forward. So that cliff edge at each point of transition needs to be uh, addressed. And I, I know Edge and others have looked at that as well, that cliff edge of when you're uh, transferring across. It's convenience for the institutions, but it's far from convenient for those who are the learners. Um, so I'm a big advocate of dip in and dip out qualifications, allowing people to build uh, their qualifications over a longer period of time and the pace that works for them. Now, that shouldn't just be the preserve for adult learners with a lifelong uh, loan entitlement, but also should be the preserve, I think, of younger learners that are coming through and are able to build those skills. I also think institutions need to think differently about their admissions process and not just on the qualifications, but also about the potential. That's difficult, that's expensive, but that personalization piece of it makes quite a big difference. When you think about some of those young people are going into professions, we need a range of skills and you need to identify that, uh, that potential for them. Mm -hmm. And also uh, perhaps the diversity of approaches, as again, Tom talked about in the degree program, where using analytical approaches that are more familiar in the arts to solve other problems or to look at solutions to other problems, again, can be relevant. Um, David, is any any thoughts on that from, from Sunderland? I think Ross's answer is absolutely spot on. I mean, interestingly, he brought back some memories of the engineering diploma and all of the diplomas um, because uh, I was the permanent secretary at the Department for Education uh, when the diplomas were introduced. And it is worth remembering, isn't it, that the diplomas were introduced because Blair government, and actually I think bluntly Tony Blair, decided that he wasn't going to accept the Mike Tomlinson review recommendations essentially to go to uh, English baccalaureate. I don't mean a baccalaureate as it's defined post-2010. Um, and I do think without being a bit grandiose about it, that was a historic missed opportunity because I think there had become quite a coalition of interest in a wider sort of qualification for all the reasons that Ross um, outlined. But I think the small C conservative instincts of the then prime minister uh, nailed it. And of course, what happened with the diplomas was that people thought, well, they're not really serious, are they? Because the government doesn't really back um, alternatives because they've protected the so-called gold standard of A-level. And I suppose the only other reflection I would have in all of this is to look at it from the university's end. And, and I think um, all of us actually are good at um, bringing people into higher education who may not have traditional qualifications. Uh, and I think when people talk about, oh, you'll have to accommodate T-levels, you'll have to accommodate, you have to accommodate this or that, Actually, I think that's been the day job for institutions like ours. And I guess it will be the same for Ross and certainly for the way Tom described um, his work, it will be that way. So I think there's a, the other end of the pipeline question of how welcoming and open are universities to people coming in without traditional qualifications? And crucially, what are they doing to enable them to succeed in higher education? No, I agree. I think that's very important you know, because it's completely wrong to take on students that we cannot, we haven't got the skills and experience to work with, that we don't understand what they're bringing to to the 
to the, the party, if you like. Um, so we thought a bit about different um, qualifications um, at level three. Um, Susan McGrath has put a question in the, um, in the Q&A, which follows up nicely from that. She says students and schools are very focused on the, the standard BA, BSc courses, but is the degree as such a perfect model for what our speakers institutions seek to deliver in the future? And if not, how do you anticipate qualifications in the tertiary and HE sector will develop? Now, who would like to begin on that one? Tom smiling, is that something for you? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to go first with this one because actually I'm uh, a preoccupation of mine, I think, is, is that actually we have had a funding system that for 20 or 30 years has pushed everything to being degree shaped. And I think that is a real challenge for us as, in, as institutions, actually. And that I think there is a little bit of a sense of the pendulum swinging back the other way, but I think it hasn't swung back sufficiently certainly for me to feel confident that we're moving to a position where there's much more of a recognition of different sizes of qualifications at different points and the potential to kind of build towards a degree in a way that a degree is not necessarily the be all and end all and the only success point so i i think it's a work in progress that but but i think at the moment we're still operating in a system in which the degree dominates in terms of he qualifications Maybe I can just come in in the back of that, Helen, because I uh, uh, typed an answer into a similar sort of question mm -hmm. earlier, and I said it is really quite remarkable the resilience of the traditional degree programme, and as I say, despite a few false dawns along the way. Um, is the lifelong learning entitlement going to change that? I don't know. Uh, and leave aside all the sort of practical and technical implementation points. I think there are some really quite fundamental questions about whether people will want to do that kind of qualification um, and what kind of incentives there will be for people to do it. So I think it's always about incentives to try to give people a good reason for doing things differently. I fear, picking up Tom's point, that that sort of um, institutional conservatism that I referred to when it came to school qualifications is probably pretty relevant in the university context as well. We all know and love something. And I made a point earlier, Helen, didn't I, that the advent of new qualifications, for example, like uh, apprenticeships, has, has actually caused a fair degree of discomfort in universities. And it's not just bureaucratic discomfort. I think we're just not used to doing it. Um, so, so there is something here about doing things differently, but recognising that you almost need enough critical mass enough people doing something different to really help it catch on would you like i can give a, a little a little bit additional uh, yeah which has already been uh, excellent around it i think there's a bit for us around and it's a really boring point but it's regulatory environment um which makes all of this really difficult so uh, for example what a measure of good looks like what the success of any of these kind of qualifications might be if you're doing a small modular for example retention rates will be different and we need to say is that acceptable is that fine because people are trying they're taking things i mean we had this with the ou uh, when the first set of the teaching excellence framework came in where you know, people would try a course before they would buy, before they take on the whole thing. So you've got different types of rates of retention around that. And you look at some of those measures of success in HA, we probably need to rethink them to make sure that diversity in the sector is able to come through in terms of qualification. There's another challenge which is uh, difficult, uh, and that is making sure that there's currency in our qualifications outside of England. And there's sometimes a risk that we always look inwards in what we do. And I know we ignored Bologna to some extent and what we did, but we need to make sure our graduates are able to interact across the world and across in Europe. And so I've got a little bit of concern of making sure there is currency in there. We're explaining that. And the very last point on this is employers themselves. Some employers don't understand the qualifications we have already. So the degree apprenticeship is a really good example. But actually, you speak to the construction and industry, and they'll still talk to you about HNC and HNDs, even though uh, a lot of institutions have moved on or moved away from those. So we need to make sure that we're bringing our employers along with us on that. And that is not an easy task to do. I can tell you uh, off the bat that, that that's not an easy task to do. So it is some of it about the co-creation with them, making sure it meets the needs of what they uh, are asking for. 
it's it's more managing change which you're all doing but that's the sort of managing change at a system level where maybe the help that is needed in terms of educating employers and educating careers advisors and potential students is basically not something for one institution to do but for the government to do if it decides what it's actually asking you to do um i think i'd like to to um nip in and do another chair's prerogative and, and ask and ask you a bit more about managing change i mean you all um got quite rapid journeys in the terms of a higher education and you know universities are fairly inert objects that progress slowly along their journey students apply one year spend three or four years on the typical undergraduate course which we've just talked about so and yet you're working at quite a pace um and I noticed for example in Sunderland you've taken that brave choice as you said of actually stopping doing things whereas our other two colleagues of course they're about starting doing things but deciding not to do some things so how do you manage those sorts of difficult decisions within your institutions whether it's stopping doing something or not doing something that some people would like but you know is just not core to your mission is that one for you first david yes thanks very much helen um i think data bluntly is very important um uh, because uh, our decisions were as much influenced by the data we had in relation to those courses as indeed uh, the decision to go into areas, particularly in the health arena, was driven by data and our understanding of future needs. And I think I mentioned again in one of the earlier answers that we worked very closely with the local enterprise partnership, looking at all of their labour market information to try to understand the best <laughs> any of us can what's coming uh, down the line. So data is important, but I do think institutional mission, exactly as you touched upon, Helen, is really important. And I think that's uh, that's work in progress, isn't it? And um, mm -hmm. none of us can assume that everyone in our organizations or institutions gets the story. Um, but that's no excuse. Our job as institutional leaders is to be discussing that story, to have it up refreshed by the people who are around us, occasionally to take people ahead through our um, leadership responsibilities. And then people hopefully start to understand what kind of institution we are. And that might mean doing some things, but not doing others. The truth is, Helen, there's not a university that I know in the world that covers every academic discipline. Mm -hmm. So in a sense, these choices have grown over time, as you say, often through inertia. So the decision not to do something shouldn't be as strange uh, as it often is in places because there is a lot of concern that if you lose a particular subject or academic discipline, it will be gone forever, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not easy, but it's a day job. That's what we have to do, manage change. Tom, Ross, any thoughts? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, there's two kind of key elements for me, and, and the first of which obviously uh, crossover with uh, what's already been said around mission. There's a real clarity about what we're trying to achieve. And I've got uh, an advantage in some way. It's new in terms of the newness means that we're recruiting staff into it who are buying into that mission. So there isn't some of that baggage, a legish, legacy piece, but also the staff do bring with them kind of experience of other institutions, which can be a bonus, but also can be a risk as well in the sense of this is how you would normally do this, or this is how we'd expect it to look like. So that piece about people understanding that mission, understanding the, the bit about the, the swiftness of things have to happen. And uh, a good example, we had a course portfolio around computing uh, science, which uh, started there in September. We've already went back through revalidation for that. We've changed that, understanding what's going on now. You, if you do that, my experience do that in a normal situation, there'd be devastation, cold cloths in the head and everything else. Here, it just feels normal. It's culture. We need to get it right. And that last piece just around culture is creating an environment where people are genuinely part of what we're doing and genuinely contributing at every step. So whether it's developing of the strategy and mission itself or actually about how we develop the spaces we're doing or the, the wider curriculum piece. So 
it, that, I think that's been really important for us is that culture element uh, and making sure that people see themselves as being part of that. So distributed leadership, um, we've got leadership posts across quite a flat structure, which um, we'll try and retain as we grow. That'll be difficult, but we'll try and retain uh, as we go and people taking responsibility. So rather than saying the university or someone else is this, it's very much us, it's all of us in this together. Tommy, I think... Yeah, I mean, some of my response will be similar to Ross's. I think, you know, we're, we're at an early stage and we've, we've also got some advantages, I think, in having a very clear mission. And, and I think that's helped us define what we're doing and what we're not doing. Um, we have been in the nice position of being approached by a lot of people who want to work with us. And I think that has required some prioritization, actually, at, around, you know, what would be nice to do, but can't be an immediate priority versus what, what we need to do. I think my only other reflection would be, so I came into this, I split my time between the college and the University of Bristol, and I'm, I'm very familiar with the HD sector. Um, and the college originated out of um, Ben Rawlins, our founder, and Owen Shears, who, who are both based in Talgarth. And they had a very clear vision for what they wanted to do, and they wanted it to be very experimental along the lines of Black Mountain College, the original in, in the States. And in a way, my job was sort of translating their vision and working with Cardiff Met to, to get it to a point where it was something that we could validate and, and take forward. And I think what I was interested in in that process, that we were lucky to have a partner with in Cardiff Met who were very open to that, very familiar with interdisciplinary work. But there were definitely some, some losses as well as gains in that process of validation. And it made me think in a way about wh whether we keep enough space is open for kind of experimentation or whether we're able to, in a sense, as institutions with the kind of pressures on us, those spaces for experimentation um, mm -hmm. and for trying new things. And I think it, actually, again, the college is quite lucky in being a space for that. But I think within a conventional HE setting, sometimes those spaces do get lost, actually, and keeping them open is, is maybe a challenge for all of us. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think we've got time just for um, this may, may be a bit unfair to ask you to respond quickly to this, but there's a question which has been sitting in the Q&A for some while, again, from Susan McGrath, and she's she's asking, how should universities be developing their approach to reconciling student independence with the need to safeguard in the broader sense? And the more that I mean, all your courses, it's about not just being within a, a, a university managed environment, and as she says, safeguarding in the broadest sense. Be interesting to know um, your approach to that and how you maybe work with students on establishing the right sort of protocols for them, bearing in mind that most of them are adults. I, I'm happy to kick off, Helen, on this yeah. one just very quickly. Um, I think the, the adults point is a very important one to make. That's uh, there. I think there are, uh, it helps in our context that we have so many professionally regulated disciplines. So this is an upside potential of regulation that, that there are clear, clear boundaries and uh, clear expectations and all of that's very important. But, but I think there is a responsibility on universities both to listen to how students are feeling, but at the same time to try to build the kind of resilience that I think everyone needs in what is a complicated and difficult world. So I think it's that it's that tension all the time. And I, I sense that we're still in the foothills of this conversation, Helen, because it feels to me, even in my sort of 12 years now as a VC, these issues have become much, much more topical and probably the uh, COVID pandemic has something to do with that. I, I think David's actually absolutely right. We are kind of, we're, we're only sort of scratching the surface at the moment in some of these issues. I, was uh, chaired a, a, a suicide safer program, for example, and that was really early on. And now things have moved on very quickly around uh, some of this. Uh, the, the concern that many have is that we are not treating sometimes students as adults around some of the, this provision, and that is a that is a real challenge. While still balancing, we have responsibilities as complex um, and challenging institutions. We should be challenging to our students. If we aren't, we're doing something wrong. So, no, you will fail at times. You will find a course difficult. You'll find an employer will tell you you're not doing the right things. These are all big uh, issues, but they're all things you'll have to deal with the rest of your life. They don't stop at the campus. They move outwards. So I see it as being that academic buoyancy, that resilience to be in the workplace is really key. So embedding it into what we're doing, seeing it as part of your core skill set as a student, 
Um, but also being very open about where our parameters are as well. And uh, I, I think, again, as institutions, we're probably not being as clear as we, we could be about where is our parameters or where we uh, have a responsibility or where we have a responsibility together. And that bit of working together is really important for us. Tom, anything to add to that from your... Yeah, just very quickly, I think the whole sector is dealing with a sort of transition from smaller to larger numbers. The whole sector has got bigger. A lot of institutions mm -hmm. have got bigger. I think some of the stresses and strains of how you retain a sense of community in those contexts are, are really important. One of the things at Black Mountains College is certainly in its early phases, it is going to be quite a small community. And I think that creates some opportunities. And we'd also expect to have quite a lot of adult learners, which I think is critical here. But having said that, climate anxiety is real among young people. Actually, and I think we're very conscious that we are creating a community that's looking at a, a range of quite challenging issues, and that comes with some responsibilities to us. And it's why we've also tried to orient our curriculum towards, you know, certain radical forms of hope and also towards practice and practical action. I think those things are, are really important and, and a part of our responsibility. The other thing I'd just say on a sector wide point is I think we sometimes talk about things like student mental health slightly too much in isolation from the mental health of a whole sort of stream of young people mm. in and outside higher education. I mean, I, th I think we should be thinking much more about young people aged 18 to 25, whether they're in higher education or not, and what support they have in society as a whole. I, I think there's been a little bit too much of a tendency to kind of place that as, it, as a university only issue. And certainly in my experience of dealing with and working with young people, it, it's not. I think that there's something larger going on there and, and it needs to be uh, uh, addressed slightly more at that level. And when you've got, for example, people on degree apprenticeship programmes where a lot of their time is spent outside your, the environment for which you have direct responsibility, then it becomes even more clear that it's a collaborative, collaborative responsibility. Well, thank you very much to our panellists and to Edge for hope for hosting this. I've certainly learned a lot. And I and I know that, you know, I, I will certainly be trying to find an excuse to head to Black Mountain College. It looks like absolutely fascinating and, and, and really interesting to hear that new initiative, but also to hear what's going on in Peterborough and in Sunderland. So um, you'll see in the chat that Ollie has put details of events coming up at EDGE um, that you may be interested in. And um, next month, they're publishing, EDGE is publishing its latest research on new higher education institutions in England. How do you develop a university for the 21st century? Um, and it's a qualitative piece of research which looks at visions for higher education institutions, the role of policy and other stakeholders, and, ha and how these institutions have approached designing learning and assessment. Um, and it questions whether they're being innov bringing innovation to the HE sector in a way that perhaps it hasn't seen before. So thank you all very much. And, um, I, and I hope to see you again at something soon. Bye bye. <laughs>